Okay, that sounds good. Mikvah is my favorite thing to talk about. So while we're, but, but then we're going to talk about Pesach. Yeah. Hi. It's being recorded. Yeah. I assume tonight was canceled because of lack of respondents. Why did somebody just show up? Who? The post. They didn't know it's repeat. Well, I just wanted to find out why. Okay. To cancel a program tonight because nobody RSVP'd, and as soon as I canceled it, like four people were like, "Well, we were coming," and I'm like, "But well, you didn't tell me know. Justin was going to stay for that." Oh he yeah, said. oh that's but right. But he didn't RSVP. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> so, Why not in my today is March 13th, yeah, 2013. <laughs> okay, uh, so the mikvah is the waters of the womb. It's the same waters that we were all born in. You know, you remember how there's evaporation, condensation, precipitation, that whole triangle you learned about a million years ago? Um, so that's, all water is the same. Um, and so the waters that we immerse in for any kind of change in our lives, converting, becoming a bride, uh, monthly immersion, becoming a grandmother, whatever the reason is you go to the mikvah, um, we, we go into these waters as if we were, it, it's really a rebirth. And so, yes, nail polish is off, jewelry's off, makeup is off, um, uh, all belly rings and any kind of rings, <laughs> clothing stripped all the way down. But it is the most modest place you can be. If you've ever had a massage and the woman says to you, or the man says to you, you know, um, um, you, they're halfway done, right? They've done your whole back and they lift up the thing, right? You're my person that I'm mass massaging. And they lift up the, cur the, the sheet and they say, okay, roll over. And they're holding it way up here like this, right? Nod that you sort of know what I'm talking about. Okay. Um, that's what it's like. So I'm standing behind you. Do you mind being my uh, yep. model? Come stand up. Can you take off your... your yep. Okay. So here's what we're going to do. <laughs> I'll leave that. All right. So we're going to we'll pretend... Yes. Then Kelly's wrapped herself in a sheet. So turn around and do back to me. So she comes out like this, okay? And I'm behind her. And none of you are there. And then I go like this. Sorry, hair. Whoops. Okay. I go like this. Okay, walk down into the mikvah. She walks all the way down. Walking. And by the time... She, and then I'll say to her, let me know when you're all the way down, although I also hear her splash and I know. And then I'm looking only from above. Thank you very much. Yep. Um, oh, and by the way, when she's done and she comes back up, I again hold it all the way up in front of me. I'm not looking. Um, there are two other rabbis with me, and they are men generally because that's all we have here, and they're on the other side of a door. Um, and if you're a guy, then you have a man watching you. Um, if the other two rabbis happen to be men, then you might have all three men in there. Um, but it's always, um, you know, it's as modest as it can be, um, and there's, you know, there's no looking. So, um, but yes. Any other mikvah questions? <laughs> okay. Oh, before I forget, pass this all to Sue, please. Pass all to Sue. Okay. This weekend. I know. <laughs> so we're talking about Passover. Um, and I'm also going to distribute, but I think this is to read for next time because for next yes. time I wrote selections from Haggadah and Rabbinical Assembly Pesach Guide to be distributed. So, I am distributing to read. It's very brief. It has a lot of information. Um, the Rabbinical Assembly, you can also, if you lose this copy, it's online too. It's Oops, on the Rabbinical Assembly website. Um, this has everything you need to know thank about you. what you can do for Pesach. Now... It's also a really confusing holiday. Um, and I think for the most part I want to talk today a little bit about it, sort of more in the theoretical, and then next time a little more in the practical. Now I'm seeing, they, were there books in here? Ah, blue books and, okay, good. Oh, orange books. Good, good, good. Just wanted to make sure the books got to work. Excellent. Thank you. So, first of all, any questions? Questions from last time, questions from readings? Everything makes sense? Yeah, Jane. Okay. Okay. So, the conservative movement in their quarterly magazine. Oh, no. You're going to start with this one? Yes. <laughs> uh, did you read the article that I was quoted in? If you're going to read the magazine, did you get to page 45? <laughs> I saw your picture okay. in it. I saw you. Did you read I it too? I didn't read no. the article. I'm sorry. You didn't read my article? You I just did. saw the picture of me? Oh. I, I saw the All picture. All about I Bethel. It out I to I and like, she's quoted a million times. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Yes. You know, I was talking about the Passover food, yes. kitten oat. Right. right. And 
how come the magazine is essentially saying, go for it, you can have your rice, you can have your beans, you can have your lentils. So the book says, not so much. Well, the, actually, the book, I, says, the book says Ashkenazi says some, some shuls are starting to go that way. Spartic. Yes. Right. <laughs> Spartic always does. Sue is married to a Spartic Jew, so she doesn't Spartan count. <laughs> I was We're like, we're going to be Sephardic, right? Yeah. <laughs> We're in Israel and we stay with our Spartic cousins that we stay with every single time we go. We're like, yay, we're Spartic this day. <laughs> so why is it different, though, between the, the two? Uh-huh. So... Um, I actually will admit that I only read the article about myself in that magazine. I did not read this article, even though everyone's talking about this article and not the article that I'm quoted in, but that's okay. I'm not insulted. Um, but I just, I, I got so excited that I was in the magazine and yeah. put it in my, you know, to file good things pile and, and forgot about reading the rest of the magazine. I admit it. Um, so I believe that it is a misunderstood article. Personally, I believe this, and I asked Rabbi Rosen his opinion, and on the one hand, he was like, well, yeah, give me out, maybe, and I know other rabbis in town are sort of coming out very um, openly and saying, yeah, sure, go for it. Um, I don't believe that, that that's what Rabbi Galinkin meant, and it sounds like what he meant was more that um, if you're in a country, if you're Ashkenazic, right, you're from these Eastern European countries, and you're in a country of Sephardic Jews, namely Israel, then, like, go for it. Because, by the way, it's very hard to not eat kidneyote when you're in Israel. Very hard. Mm -hmm. um, everything, everything. And, and so how can you survive? Um, that's what it sounds more like he was trying to say. But it was published in this magazine that is mainly of the North American movement, and everyone is taking it to mean that they can eat kidney oat. There will not be kidney oat in my house. Um, we won't even eat green beans. Although when we read that, I read that in here, I was, was like, like, "Wait!" <laughs> I was like, no. But isn't the whole thing like, from what I understood in the book, was that you can make flour? That it's this possibility of making flour and <coughs> the possibility of leavening. Mm -hmm. That is the concern. So like a green bean, their point was the reality that you could make a green bean into a flour <laughs> is so far re right. removed at that point right. that they're okay. Right. Whereas rice, clearly there's rice flour out there. Right. I mean, you know, there's right. certain things that you can Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Because um, like even so kidney much. bean flour, I've never heard of. You know, and so with Pesach, you know, I, I really think there's the letter of the law and the spirit of the law comes into play here a lot. Um, and so... You can, you can totally argue that. In green beans, that can be your excuse, your, or your reasoning. It's not even an excuse, and that can be totally fine for you. For me, it feels wrong. Um, and, and that's why, by the way, whenever anyone asks me anything about kashrut on Pesach, I do not answer off the top. I always go and check everything because I never feel like I know the answer. You say to me canola oil right now or, or olive oil, and I'm like, oh, oh man. You know, and so even when we did our shopping this week, before we, we went, I, Adam and I were looking at this list, literally looking at the list that's here. And, you know, if you just take a quick look, you'll see it. It's on page, um, committed food, two, two. so it's on the top of page eight. Um, okay. Nine. No, so products which may be purchased without a Pesach hexture before or during Pesach. Olive oil, extra virgin only. Okay, that to me was like, that was news, um, and maybe it's because I forgot from last year, I don't know, but I know that in the past I've always bought all of the ridiculously expensive teeny tiny bottles, you know, where I need like two splashes of olive oil, and I bought, you know, Haolam olive oil or whatever it's called, and, and I'm like, you know, this is the most expensive olive oil I've ever owned. Oh my goodness, I said to Adam, just buy a new bottle of the stuff we always get. <gasps> Yeah. But but I wouldn't have remembered that if I hadn't looked at this. So it's really complicated, and I'm a rabbi telling you that. Um, and we'll look more at this list next time. I didn't mean to, like, you know, okay. get a, unless you have questions right now that I could try to but answer. Just a, yeah. Hopefully this is a quick question. If it's not, we could just move it to next week. <laughs> but I got this sense, and I just want to know if I read it wrong, because maybe I should read it again, that a lot of these do or don't, especially with the... Um, you know, with the or without the the four Passover, I got the sense that it was because some of these things normal, like on occasion, have additives. 
that mm -hmm. yeah. are considered potentially a leavening product. But but in reality, if you found pure rice, you know, like, oh, that says without. But so if there's things that you know, like if it's extra, it's saying extra virgin only. But right. you've got olive oil, and all it says is olives are the ingredient. Right. W wouldn't the conclusion be that you no. know what's in it? Probably not. Oh, yeah, because okay. I think what they were saying is sometimes there's things in like in preservatives and stuff that right. you don't. But they don't know. have to declare right, right. in the right. lovely right. USDA of this right. Point. And even so, the quinoa the debate is a really big debate, right? Um, I don't know enough about what quinoa really is, seeds. Seeds. right? So, but the issue seeds. really is where it grows. That it grows next to barley, and so could some barley get into it? Now they are like selling actual kosher for Pesach quinoa. So the idea is that it's totally available and totally something that all of us Ashkenazi Jews can eat. For, for the past couple years that quinoa has been the popular thing to talk about, I've been really opposed to it um, and really opposed, like on a soapbox about it. So I'll just share my soapbox, but then this morning actually somebody told me something different. But my soapbox has always been that quinoa grows in countries in South America where this was their staple product until us you know, a Whole Foods North American people decided mm -hmm. that this was the cool thing to eat. You know, quinoa was the new black or whatever. Mm -hmm. Like, it was the cool thing to do. And so it's so expensive for that they can't afford to eat it anymore in the South American countries. And so I was literally calling quinoa the bread of affliction, taking words right out of the Haggadah. This is the bread of our, the affliction that our, our forefathers ate in Egypt. How dare we eat this food at our Seder where we're talking about freedom and we're worried about poverty for others? How the, the, the you know, it might be kosher, but ethically, right? And you have to think about the bigger things. Ethically, it's not kosher. All that to say, and I don't serve quinoa in my house and still will not, but somebody this morning said to me, yes, I've heard that argument, but I've seen a counter to that, which is that now that we pay so much for the quinoa, um, those in the South American countries are actually making a lot of money. They can afford now to eat other things, and aren't you so glad they're not just eating quinoa? So, okay, fine. Um, <laughs> I still don't know that it belongs on the Seder table, because um, I'm, I'm just not about cheating and getting around it. it for me, it doesn't feel right. Um, that was a long way to answer that question, but yeah, it's complicated. This Pesach stuff is complicated. There's just no way around that. Other questions? Dare I ask? Uh, it ain't easy. Um, I guess my, my question is now, why is it okay for like um, Sephardic to eat rice and not for the Ashkenazi? I think the, Did the we talk about that? I'm I think to that the, the book said because it's their like dietary mm -hmm. staple, every single ah, thing they yeah. make okay. has which is historically. And part I thought of they the also original. said, right. correct me if I'm wrong, that everybody had eaten it and that they then expelled those things because they realized flour or things could be made from it. That it was something that technically was open for, and then at some point in time they. Ashkenazi decided to remove it or mm -hmm. something. I don't know. Yeah, to go to a to higher level, let's mm -hmm. say. We do like to go to those higher levels and be more machmir, more strict, mm -hmm. more stringent about okay. things. Yes. Mm -hmm. So let's just take a step back on Pesach for a second. Why do we, what is Pesach? The Exodus. Okay, so historical we started with, right? This Exodus from Egypt. Um, big moment, finally getting to leave Egypt. What else is it? Freedom. Okay, freedom, right? That's sort of tied to the yeah. the historical, but also us being born as a nation, right? Here we are, free, great. What else? Think maybe not in this country, but elsewhere. Seasonally. No, spring. It's spring. Another name for Pesach is Chag Ha'aviv, the spring holiday. Um, all of our pilgrimage festivals are also agricultural festivals. And so here we have the beginning of spring. And there's a lot of symbolism, the parsley, right, the karpas, parsley or celery, whatever you have on your table, and um, the egg represents spring also. So there's a lot of things about the holiday that are supposed to be spring-like. Um, so, you know, to, it's important to notice each holiday is going to have a historical connection and an agricultural connection. And, and to find a way to sort of mark that. So maybe it's that you put beautiful tulips on your table or something to, I know it doesn't feel like spring quite yet, but it will. <laughs> it will. 
And what are some of the most important things we do on Pesach? We clean. Okay, we clean, yes. <laughs> and then we clean some more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> take out the hummus. Okay, we have to take out all of the chametz, all of the all of the things that could be leavened, right? And and even to the point where you can't serve it, you can't benefit in any way, right? So you can't serve it to your pets. Pretty intense. Mm -hmm. um, okay. What else? What are some other big values on Pesach? Usually with family. Okay, so it's a big family kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. And you're going Traditions. through the Haggadah. Mm -hmm. Reading the Haggadah. What's another Jewish value that creeps into every holiday, the one mitzvah. way or another? Pardon Ooh. me? The mitzvah? Okay, what's the mitzvah? <laughs> There's a couple of Donating options. your hummets to the needy. Okay, so we donate what we don't need, right? We So we clean out our pantries and you find those soup cans that you just like, they're totally good for somebody else. You get them out of your house, um, right? It's okay to close up the things, you know, you've got this like, big canister filled with lentils or something and it's a huge you know you can't donate that because it's open and it's a huge waste to throw it out so that's the kind of stuff you seal away and you sell right you know this concept of how we sell it here we sell it to Louis our, our custodian anyone who wants to do that can come in and sign a little piece of paper you write down your address and you say Louis anytime you want the keys under the doormat just come come to my house <laughs> take all my team um, so it's a very interesting rabbinic loophole that we offer. Um, and then, of course, as Passover ends, Rabbi Rosen's always pacing the hallways here. Where's Louie? Did he forget? Because it's like 8 <laughs> o'clock on a, you know, a Tuesday night or something, and it's not like a night like tonight where things are going on. Like, you know, the building's been pretty quiet, and so, like, did Louie remember to come over? And Louie, sure enough, he shows up. <laughs> Here's your dollar, Rabbi Rosen. I'd like to buy all the chametz back from the congregation. Um... <laughs> Or so, so other way around. Like, you know what I meant. You yeah. knew what I meant. I was just checking. It's been a long day. Um, okay, but there's another important value. So we talked about getting rid of the food we don't need. Let's make donations. Great, making donations. And so in for Pesach we have a special concept ma'ot chitin, which is literally like money for wheat that we're like helping people to to be able to purchase what they need. Pesach is not cheap, right? If you want to really do Pesach, you, you're you buying a lot of... Oh, I have to remember to buy my brisket. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, I'm writing down brisket. You're buying, <laughs> you're buying a lot of food and a lot of stuff, and um, it can feel very, very challenging. And so um, they say, you know, think of what you're going to spend and try to give 10% of that. Um, which, you know, is a, is a really important value. Uh, what else? Yeah. It's a good time not to tell your husband how much you spend on Passover. <laughs> I yeah. never do. You never do. I never do. No. I because start off every holiday trying to keep track. I keep those long receipts in my purse. And I think, you know, because every, like, huge, and then it's like, could you run and get lemons? Oh, my goodness, I forgot this. Oh, go to the store and get this. Oh, I have to write one other thing down. I'm sorry. <laughs> I just remembered I need the U.S. side candle. Um, <laughs> the mind during Pesach is a dangerous thing. It's like you are so intent, like, ten different places right now. Wow, at least I am. I don't know. So, woo, focus. Um, because on Pesach, by the way, it's one of the many times during the year that we say that we have Yisker, the end, the last day of Pesach, where we remember those uh, loved relatives who have died. Um, and so we do that on Pesach, we do it on Shavuot, we do it at the end of Sukkot on Shemini Atzeret, and we do it on Yom Kippur. Um, and then the fifth time, obviously, is the actual yard site of the person's death, the day that they died. Um, and so I just made the note because I remembered, oh, I need to get a candle because you light a candle if you've lost anyone. So. I uh, need to remember to do that. Um, so I wanted to go back to chametz for a second because we're all over the place here. How do we get rid of the chametz? What's that little um, evening ritual? Dusting. There we go. Everyone's <laughs> dusting. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so so you can buy the kit. Um, it's a nice feather, a candle, a wooden spoon. 
and um, you know, in the envelope it comes in basically, and it's a little ritual. Now, what if you've got the most clean house in the world, and you never eat anywhere other than your kitchen, and so, <laughs> I know, the best place to look is in front of the TV. I know, I know, I'm with you <laughs> under the couch. Um, but let's pretend we're not those people, and we only eat in the kitchen, and so everything is totally spotless, and your kitchen is top to bottom totally spotless. I promise you, I swear to you, there is no chametz. Now what? You still do it. How? Put some in. Okay, great. Where? Yeah. In other words, all over the house, right? So you take it, you put it in a little tin foil or something, or a little plastic bag, whatever you want, and you actually place it. I, as a kid, I thought this was like just my parents being silly parents, but it's like really what people do, right? You do like a little treasure hunt. Um, so much fun. It's so much fun, right? So you have little kids, you do a little treasure hunt, and you can, like, teach them hot and cold. It's a great time to do that kind of thing. Um, but, yeah, you put, you know, uh, I think it's five or ten. I forget what they say you're supposed to do. If you There's know, no significant number. There's no significant number? Are you telling me? I don't remember. Um, I usually do one in each room. Um, so if you're lucky enough, do 20. Um, but, you What's know, one, in the bag? A little bread, piece of bread. Or or whatever. Whatever, whatever, you, whatever you still have at that point. Take your thing of bread crumbs and like dump it into 14 different cities. Very carefully. Put them all around, all around the house. <laughs> and you have to remember where you've put them. Somebody has to be the master of the chametz. Um, and you go around and you collect them. And when you get there, you know, pretend this is my, my feather, my wooden spoon. And you sort of like you do this whole little thing because you don't want to be you know, using everything else that's already clean, so you can use the candles, you can really see. It's a very silly ritual, but the bigger point is that we are really trying with our best effort to make sure that we have gotten rid of all of the chametz. And at the end, we say this, this, this little paragraph where we basically say, look, I tried my best. Anything I didn't get at this point is null and void. It is like the dust of the earth. And I think that's a beautiful paragraph. Mm -hmm. I've actually quoted that for people I have a friend trying to finish her dissertation, and she keeps, you know, writing on Facebook every morning. She's up, like, way before her kids, and she's so stressed, and she's so committed. And, and I keep saying to her, you know, good enough is also very good. Um, and at some point, you just have to say, like, I have, I have corrected everything I can correct. Like, I'm not going to be perfect here, and that's okay. Um, you, she's trying her hardest, and you certainly try your hardest. You don't say, eh, whatever, I'm not cleaning my toaster. You know, obviously you're cleaning your toaster. And by the way, you don't just clean it. Are you using your toaster the week of Pesach? No, the toaster goes away. Like, all those things have to disappear completely. Um, and, and if you're really smart like me, I finally learned after all these years, you hire people to help you. Uh, my mother used to always complain, this isn't freedom. I feel like a slave. Mm -hmm. And so I finally realized that what you do is you get some, I'm actually getting kids to help me, community service hours. Um, I know, don't even have to pay them. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we're starting on Sunday, emptying my cabinets. And, oh, I'm very excited. So, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see. Okay, uh, actually in your reading you're going to read about this, so we'll talk about it next time, but um, how to cush your items. Mm -hmm. um, versus purchasing it was, them. Was, oh, it's it in there too? Oh, okay. It was in. Okay, good. So then we will talk about it. What did you learn? <laughs> right. Here's, here's the principle. You, and this is not just Passover. This is everything. You kosher something as you use it. No. You kosher something in the same manner in which you use it. Okay? So a pot that boils water is koshered in a pot of boiling water. Right? An oven that heats, obviously, is koshered by heating it. Um, a metal, you know, tongs that is used to put over, you know, that you put, take, put in the hot, whatever, you put over hot. Um, so whatever it is, you know, your barbecue, not that you're really, I don't know, be interesting. Bar you we barbecue on Pesach? Yeah, we do. Interesting. I've never we thought do. of doing that. Grill. Why not? Why not? Because the, the grill, there's no way to get the grill clean unless you change out the whole grill. Yeah, you, you have a different you grate. You have a different grate? Disintegrate and fall to pieces. <laughs> but can you, you do it the same way you're doing your oven? Because it's basically an That's oven. what I would think. Yeah, I've think never thought to use a barbecue on Pesach, but huh. It's also cold here. 
Sometimes. So you, you have special Pesach. Every great. We have everything. We have um, different mixers. We have different uh, food Electric processors. <laughs> we have different meat dishes, dairy dishes. I have a whole set of parv dishes and parv baking things. Yeah. Oh, it's just a pleasure. A coffee <laughs> pot. I have my fish dishes that are only to serve oh, fish and the Seder. <laughs> Glassware. Mm -hmm. Shredding things, blending things. Oh yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sounds like fun. So like so if you if you're like do you have like one good set of knives, you have to just boil them or something, or what do you would you do to get them? <laughs> uh, I would buy new knives. Inside? Just get another set of knives. Um I suppose, I think it does talk about does. utensils it that you does. can do. And yeah. If you can take the, like, if you can take the handle out, I think is what it talks about, right? Right, right. putting it, because you want to subject it to really, really high heat, and you don't want the handle to melt. Well, and I'm thinking, like, if you had, like, steak knives, where you don't yeah. want the, like, you can't wood. get the wood, yeah. uh, you can't get stuff out from in between the metal yeah. and the wood. They're all one-piece metal knives. Probably. It's complicated. I've said that now twice. Um, Pesach is complicated. Yep. Right, and so so sometimes, you know, you have to weigh what's easier. Is it easier to kosher things, or is it easier to just to have an extra set? Obviously, it's a financial burden to have an extra set, but I do recommend for this Christmas tree shops, because everything is super cheap, or home goods. Um, you know, oh, Home Goods has everybody been there yet? That's so fun. Oh, the oh new my goodness. Right here. Oh. Right here. Uh, oh, where Borders used to be. Uh, by the movie theater in Avon. Oh. Oh. Just opened last week. Oh, I've been there. Is it across from the Hartford Medical Group? A little bit further. No, no, no further right down. The, the Simsbury, by Chile. Simsbury, like the Bushy Blacks Hill by the mall, but by the uh, so the, by where Bed Bath and Beyond is. There is a wall almost right so much. to where the, oh, there's a Walgreens. the Honda dealership is. Okay. Right before that, that, right. Yeah, oh, okay. there's a Walgreens, there's a McDonald's, there's okay. a stop and shop right there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I shop there often. Yeah. <laughs> so. I have a question. Yeah. So when my husband and I were dating, and I was in his apartment making dinner, and I open up the drawer and I start cutting the piece of chicken with a milk knife. And I realized halfway through my mother-in-law, who doesn't live there either, my now mother-in-law, she's like, what? And I'm like, that's a milk knife. <laughs> and I'm like, ree, ree, ree. <laughs> and she's like, that's okay, that's okay. And she took it from me and my husband now at the time we were dating had this huge plant. Um, and she took it, like crammed it dirt. in the dirt. Yeah. She goes, yep. leave it there for a month, you're all good. I'm like, yeah. a month? <laughs> okay. That knife sat in the dirt for, for Did it a rust? month, clashing itself <laughs> in the dirt. And that's something that to this day, if anybody in my house accidentally takes something out of a drawer, I say, I'm like, that's okay, don't worry about it. And I take it and I go stick it in my plant. And I really don't know if that's okay or yeah, not okay. That is. It but is. that's what I do. <laughs> it is, it is. That's how we posture things when we make mistakes. I bet you're gonna find all the specifics here, because again, Probably the reason I don't have answers off the top of my head is because I don't do any of the cooking or anything in our house. So, you know, I, um, but we have kashrut coming up down the road, right? Oh, we do, we do at the end. So we will look at that um, details by details by detail. Then it talks about flatware, and I bet it's going to talk about errors in the kosher kitchen right there. Mm -hmm. So you can check it out ahead of time, or yes, but um, yes. Indeed. But you can't take all of your silverware and put it in the dirt a month ahead before Passover <laughs> and pull it out and wash it and use it for Pesach. <laughs> I would guess. But it is saying you can boil it, so there are other options. Right. I guess it's not a mistake. So it's right. not a mistake. Right. So that's probably where the where it falls into yeah. that. <laughs> what I did. It, yeah, go ahead. What I did like is that if you had a set of dishes that had not been used. In more, than, a, one yes. yeah, more right. than a year, then yes. 
you're you're just good to go. Yes, yes. and I like that. Yes, that is true. Yeah, the statue of religion. That's true. Also, with you know, if you, um, I remember being taken into my grandmother's closet when I was like five or six years old. She climbed up on a ladder and she showed me the china that she had been given. I think for her wedding or inherited from somebody <laughs> and had never maybe had used or somebody had used, but it had been sitting there for years and years and years. And I knew when I finally inherited it, it was just fine. Um, and that is really crazy, but cool. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, yes. Um, yeah. You know, so in Israel, it's very cool. On I, 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 The year I lived in Israel, um, I was on a kibbutz. And so I really got to see like Jewish living. Um, but even when you're walking around the streets of Tel Aviv or Jerusalem, I believe you can see this also, the weeks, the days before Pesach, there's like a huge garbage can, basically, of boiling water and a guy who's in charge. And you can just come and you can just dip awesome. your stuff in and kosher it. Because in a very different economic society, people just did not and do not own two of everything. Or if you're keeping really kosher, right, milk and meat and milk and meat. Um, in my house, we also have milk and meat for Sukkot because I don't like to bring my good dishes outside. So we have plastic uh, Frisbee-like dishes, um, <laughs> which are quite amusing. But, you know, so like, and then I have my china. Um, so I guess I have seven sets of dishes in my house. Um, it's kind of crazy if you think about it. Um, most people don't do that. It's Where do you keep it all? I was going to say, especially in Israel, the places are, right. their homes are usually so... Right. Oh, I'm, like, my basement. I'm like, my like, house is too. filled with, with child stuff. <laughs> right. <laughs> right, I keep it in my basement, and, you know, thank God we have a big basement. The meat and milk dishes mm -hmm. and the meat and milk pots and pans and the meat and milk mixer and the meat and milk yeah. and everything else are all in the basement, yeah. Yeah. boxed up and labeled. And they yeah. go back in the same boxes that they do every year afterwards. Right. Ours, yeah, ours are in Rubbermaid bins. Yes, Rubbermaid bins. And they're all labeled. Yeah. Yep. So when we redid our kitchen, I, you know, sound like I'm like, I'm, you don't understand. We keep kosher, and it's like, okay, I get it. You're Jewish. I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> 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 right, right. right. Um, yeah. So, okay. I want to switch gears a little bit because I don't want Pesach to only be this really stressful holiday. It's this holiday where we're really experiencing our freedom. So, how would you say we celebrate our freedom? The one is that you're resting. Okay, to the we pillow lean. Yep. To the side. Is that it? Well, you get together with your family and have a dinner. Yeah. Drinking wine. Drinking the Drinking wine. wine. There you go. Now we're coming up with the ideas, <laughs> right? So it's really important to really feel like we've left Egypt and to figure out how that is. So, um, I can send to all of you guys, I'm actually, or maybe I'll bring it next week, um, my creative Seder guide that I made last year. Um, I'll bring that next week, which is just pages upon pages of ideas of things you can do to really feel that freedom a little bit more. So for instance, um, making paper chains, those of you with kids, this is a really fun activity to do. Having everybody, you know, you bring it around the table, you have everyone put their arms through the paper chains, and as we're singing, we were slaves in Egypt, um, you feel like you're, you know, uh, bound up by the chains, and then you say we're free. You can, you know, move your arms, take them out. Um, so there's a lot of ways to try to like physically experience it. I often do. We we do two seders each night right now because my kids are so little that I feel like we have to do one at 4:30 for them and then do one at 7:30 for the grown-ups. I like to be crazy. Um, <laughs> two seders wasn't enough, so let's try four. four. <laughs> Um, and so for the kids, we do it in the living room on the floor and that sense of something is really different because all that has to happen is you have to get somebody to say why, right? The four questions, why? Why is this night different than all other nights? And so, you know, as soon as you're not sitting in your kitchen feeding them what, you know, or eating yourselves what you usually eat, all of a sudden it's different. And so to try to make it different and to try to feel relaxed and to try to feel, I mean, I don't know how anyone feels relaxed on this holiday, but to try um, and to try to just feel how special this is, I think is really important. I brought today, because I wanted to show you, um, 
I don't really collect Hug a Dote, but I do have some favorites um, that I wanted to just bring in. It's a really cool thing to be able to, um, you know, if, if you're ever interested in collecting Hug a Dote, so I should probably know who this is. This is the Copenhagen. Um, somebody else will see it. Um, in any case, so this is just a beautiful Haggadah blah 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 that I brought in that I have no idea now where it came from. <coughs> Bless, Bless you. you. Um, so I'll pass these around in a second. Oh, this I think is the Copenhagen. Um, I mean, you know, people who just take the Oh, this is the Rosenthalia Lipnik Haggadah. Okay. Um, and it's just beautiful. Are yeah. still recording? Yeah. Just beautiful stuff in here and, like, the art and the lettering and whatever. But this is my favorite Haggadah that I use every year. Um, anyone ever seen this before? The Moss Haggadah? So David Moss um, is an artist and personal friend. I got this for my bat mitzvah in 1990, so... Um, I think actually that was the year it came out. Um, yeah, 88, 90. He does, um, he does paper cuts. Oh, see, if you flip through here, you'll actually find like all of our family songs. We sing one in Ladino, um, which is really cool. So, um, I mean, this is all a reprint, but they include one of his paper cuts. And I, ha I mean, at my bat mitzvah, I had no idea that I would be a fan of paper cuts, but I am my whole house. All of our artwork is paper cuts. Um, so this is the bird cage. Um, and perched strange bird-headed Jews inspired by an early Ashkenazic Haggadah manuscript. When the next page is turned, the phrase, we were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt, appears as the bird figures are locked in a cage. The doors of the cage are based on the infamous gates of Auschwitz. So, so if you see here, it looks like the Arbe yeah. Fry. And so, the way this Haggadah works um, is you can actually, and this one's just gorgeous, um, where is that page with the bird cage? So here it is again, and like here you just see it, it's before we were slaves in Egypt, so here you just see it, um, you know, not as a paper cut. Um, just really cool. So I'm going to pass these around. What I wanted to show you also in this one, because I just, how can I not? This is like my favorite Haggadah. Um, you know, so here you've got, you know what this page is representing? The four, four, four children. Four sons. No, not questions. Four children. Four children. Right? Wise. Um, wise, wise, simple, wise, simple, rebellious, doesn't know how to ask. Um... And then, or well, wise rebellious support is not asked. Sorry. Um, and then, this is a really heavy book. Hold on. Ah. Kind of just love this lamb here. <laughs> um, so my favorite thing about Pesach and, you know, is this part here that I was mentioning before. In every generation, we are obligated to see ourselves as if we left Egypt. And what do you see here? Mirrors. 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 How cool is that? If you can't afford a Mas Haggadah, what you can afford to do is take all the mirrors you have in your house, like the little hand mirrors or the ones out of your purse, out of your purse. <laughs> <laughs> Stick it on your table. Turn it upside down on the table. And when you get to this part, tell everyone to reach into the middle of the table, not their cell phones, their mirrors. Pick up the mirror and look at themselves. Or better yet, point it at somebody else and say, you left Egypt. This is your story too. I just think that's so cool. And then, and then here we are 
Betzei Yisrael Mimitzrayim, when the children of Israel left Egypt. And I don't know if you can see this all the way down there, but it's, it's, it's people just leaving Egypt. Um, so to experience Pesach, you know, in a way where, um, you know, the art sort of makes it make sense. So here, I'll pass this around and, and pass this one around too. I mean, you're welcome to look at all of them. But just, just to sort of get a picture of, um, you know, some of the beauty that's out there. Um, I can really make a difference. Last year I bought, or two years ago now, there was a new Haggadah that came out. That's the other cool thing to do is to look. Who was it? It was um, David David Englander. Is that his name? And Jonathan Safran Foyer wrote the, it was called the New American Haggadah. Um, did you I see that? One. So I bought one for my mm -hmm. husband. Um, and that was a really cool, uh, you know, to look at Pesach in sort of in today and um, in American culture. So it's a really cool thing. I, I also, next week, um, we're actually going to look at the Haggadah in a little more detail, but in case you're looking to buy one, there are tons. Um, you know, we use a pretty traditional one in my family. Um, this is one you guys use. Um, you know, there's also a different night, which is sort of um, a much more modern one. And if you're looking to... Um, Sort of do it yourself. Um, if you go to a website called JewishBoston.org, they have it's sort of the um, we'll have a Jewish Hartford or what, my Jewish Hartford we're calling it down the road. Down the road. Yeah, there is a, the current the current Federation website is Jewish, Jewish, Jewish Hartford, Hartford, but now we're going to have my we're going to have my Jewish Hartford.org. But this is JewishBoston.org, and it's a project out of their federation, and it's an amazing website, and they put out basically a downloadable, customizable Haggadah. So when we do our early Seder with our children, we just use that. Um, and it's like 22 pages, you know, very simple, no art, just the quick, easiest parts of the blessings, easy translations. It is like Seder, light, light, light. Um, but if that's what you need, it's a great thing to find. So JewishBoston.org, and you will find that. So I saw one online, um, Haggadah, someone... Yeah obviously had toddlers said like the 30 minute Haggadah or something yeah. and it was a, it's I big had a couple little pages and it was very she's like it's very the reviews are like this is very quick if you have little itty bitty children yeah. get this Haggadah right. because, <laughs> because it's yeah. very short sweet it like you said it right. has gets to the point gets, and, and that's it has the like, simplest prayers and yeah gets it done if you have to get it done with right. little ones right so I did want to show you two other um, things this time. Um, so yeah, I'm going to do that. Hold on just a second. Any questions as you're looking at the Haggadahs? The one that you use, um, do you have one for everyone? No. So In fact, the coolest go? way to do it is to have everybody using their own Haggadah. Have everybody, oh, right? <coughs> everybody yeah, on their own, and, and, and but look, that's it in a family where you're not reading it. Is French, <laughs> and another one is all Hebrew, right? And another one has bits of English, <laughs> right? It doesn't work when everybody, uh, you know, if, if you need, if you need English. We or did that last right. year, but it can be really fun. Um, you know, it can be a fun experience. Oh, so. <laughs> So I passed out these orange books just because. <coughs> um, it must have been in the readings that it mentioned Shir Hashirim, the Song of Songs, right? Mm -hmm. And it occurred to me that it was it was um, it could be an in one ear out the other if I didn't just point it out to you. So these orange books are the five Megillot, the five scrolls, plus the Book of Jonah. Um, and they're read on various holidays, and Shir Hashirim, the Song of Songs, is read on uh, Pesach. Wait, what, sorry, can, what's the five scrolls? These are the five scrolls, five Megillot, like the Megillah of Esther that we read on Purim, um, Ecclesiastes, Kohelet that we read on Sukkot, um, Echa, Lamentations that we read on Tisha B'Av, and uh, which one did I just forget? Ruth, that we read on Shavuot. Um, and then Shir HaShirim, the song of songs that we read on Pesach. So, what is Shir HaShirim all about? Oh, 
what you think it should be about? If you've never looked at this text, what would you think it should be about? What scroll would we read on Pesach? Okay, it should be about Exodus. Absolutely. Freedom, right? What else? What did Exodus and freedom lead to? What happened next historically? Walking around for 40 years. Walking around for 40 years. Tiny bit before that, what happens? All the, the splitting. Tiny bit after that, what happens? Yeah, yeah, Revelation, right? Getting the Torah. What is the product of Revelation? A relationship, right? A covenant <clears throat> between us and God. So what, in fact, is Shir HaShirim all about? If you'll open to page 5, just start reading a little bit. You probably have heard some of this quoted elsewhere in your lives. The Song of Songs by Solomon. Oh, give me the, of the kisses of your mouth, for your love is more delightful than wine. Your ointments yield a sweet fragrance. Your name is like finest oil. Therefore, do maidens love you? And on and on and on. And on and on and on. <laughs> the Song of Songs, thank you, Shir Hashirim, is this beautiful love poetry, erotic at times, love poetry. Um, if you go to page, uh, where are the page numbers? If you go to page six, the next page. Chapter 2, very famous lines. I am a rose of Sharon, a lily of the valleys. Like a lily among thorns, so is my darling among the maidens. That's one of the most famous lines. Like an apple tree among the trees of the forest, so is my beloved among the youths. I delight to sit in his shade, and his fruit is sweet to my mouth. It's beautiful. Every year we debate if we can let the teenagers read it, and every year we say, oh, God, no. No. <laughs> no. Um, so what we do is the Shabbat of Pesach, so the Shabbat during the week of Pesach, right? Because Pesach is those first two seders, meaning two days of Yantif, two days of holiday. And then you've got this week, I mean this year, uh, Wednesday and Thursday, wait, Monday night, Tuesday night. No, Monday, Monday night, night and Monday Tuesday, 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 Tuesday night. Tuesday night into Wednesday. So you've got Thursday and Friday are normal days, but it's still Pesach. Then Shabbat, which is a normal day, but Shabbat and Pesach. Yeah. Then Sunday, Sunday night, we start the holiday again. No seders or anything, thank God. Not even in my house. Um, but then the last two nights of Pesach are, are again holidays. Um, and, uh, wait, hold on one second. Oh, right, so we just don't have class next week. No, we have, we have Sorry, we have class on the 20th. Week. We don't have class yeah, that's during, following, Passover. during Pesach, right? Because Yantif will end Wednesday night. It will be too late. Um, but right, we'll, by April 3rd, it will all be over. Um, not that we want to rush the holiday. In any case, the holiday does end with these two days of Yantif, Monday and Tuesday, Sunday night into, into uh, Tuesday night. And, you know, there's no specific ritual. It's just coming, to, except for Yisker, saying the prayers at the end as we remember those we've lost. Um, but back to Shabbat, the Shabbat of Chol HaMoed, as we call it, during this week of the holiday. That's when we read Shir HaShirim and, um, you know, just sort of savor this beautiful relationship that we have with God. Um, and that's what that's all about. So we're not going to actually read it, but I wanted you to know that it existed because they're just sort of mentioning it. I felt like it was important to see it in context. So one other thing I wanted to show you in context tonight, especially since I made a guy schlep in the book, um, but I think we have to share these. Oh, you have some? Okay. Go. Um, they mentioned this also, <clears throat> which is, yeah, we won't really look so much at it, but um, they mentioned Pirkei vote, the ethics of our sages. I forget if we've looked at any of that together here before, but basically on the weeks between um, Passover and Shavuot, which will be seven weeks later, ooh, let's talk about the Omer after this. Um, we actually do talk about the Omer on the third, but I want to just bring it up. So on the weeks between Passover and Shavuot, there are 49 days plus one, 50 days, between Passover and Shavuot. And on those weeks, it's customary, especially on Shabbat, to study a chapter or, or some selections from Pirkei Avot, Ethics of Our Sages. So if you open to page 602 in our Sidorim, yep. and you'll just see a little snippet of that. 
602. And it's all these sort of pithy little ethical statements. Number one, Moses received Torah from God at Sinai. He transmitted it to Joshua. Joshua to the elders, the elders to the prophets, the prophets to the members of the great assembly. We could spend hours talking about what that all just meant. And they formulated three precepts. Be cautious in rendering a decision. Rear many students. Build a fence to protect Torah. We've talked about that fence right yeah, here, right? It makes yeah. sense to you. And just so you see, I mean, you look at number two, maybe you've even heard this one. The world rests on three things, on Torah, on service of God, and on deeds of love. Um, you've probably heard that one, but then I know you've heard. Hold on, go to page 607, number 14. And I know most of you have heard this famous statement of Hillel. If I am not for me, who will be me? Who, who will be? If I am for myself alone, what am I? And if not now, when? These are sort of these pithy little statements. They're not in any way, um, you know, decrees, rulings. It's not like other times we've seen the Mishnah. It's simply um, ethical statements on how to consider living your life. Sometimes they contradict each other a little bit. This guy says this thing. This guy says this thing. What are the three most important things? We've got a bunch of threes, and sometimes they conflict. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a beautiful thing, and this is truly what we'll do here as well um, but, uh, at, at our Shabbat Minchar, Shabbat afternoon study time. Very briefly, we'll pick out one of these, and we'll just read it. And we'll just, you know, what do you think? What does this mean to you? And again, I think it's sort of about that relationship. We, we've... We've left Egypt, we've had revelation, or we're getting ready really for revelation historically, um, and it's all about, right, because Shavuot celebrates our, our, the revelation of Torah, it's all about understanding who we are in relation to each other and to God. And that's what this, this time is all about, it's this renewal, this rebirth. It's great that we started by talking about the mikvah, same concept, renewal, rebirth, relationship. Um, feeling those kinds of connections. So Shir Hashiri in the Song of Songs, this deep, passionate love, and then these kinds of statements, which are sort of how we live our lives. How do I be? How do I move? How do I, how do I relate to other people? Um, and it's all, of course, under the general framework of, of study and of learning and of engaging with these beautiful texts. Um, so, there we go. Questions? I want you to know these things exist. So next time, if you have a Haggadah at home that you want to bring in and we can look at them together, I'll have mine here. Um, and I was sort of thinking that we would walk a little bit through the Seder um, and just, you know, share ideas, get ideas, feel a little bit more like, um, I'm not bringing in any food. <laughs> Don't get excited. Um, but, you know, just to sort of talk through what the process of going through the Seder is all about. So feel free to bring in any of those kinds of things and to read the Pesach Guide so we can try to answer any questions. <laughs> Sound good? <laughs> All right. right. Just as a quick correction, it just says, a little bit typical, traditionally Ashkenazi do this, which is not to consume those items. Then it says Sephardic tradition never impose those additional prohibit prohibitions. prohibitions. Thanks. Yeah. Um, but then it does say, some have suggested that eating of rice, corn, beans, millet, soy, and legumes, um, that for the sake of Jewish unity, all Jews should adopt the Sephardic tradition. But this has not yet become the standard practice, and readers should consult their rabbis for further guidance. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, have where we you heard what I have yeah. to yeah. ask. Yeah. Yeah. Like wrapping up answer to any question. Oh, you know, consult your rabbi? Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> sure. <laughs> They don't want that obligation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>